Please stay tuned for important disclosure information at the conclusion of this episode. Hi, and welcome to The Long View. I'm Jeff Batak, Chief Ratings Officer for Morningstar Research Services. And I'm Christine Benz, Director of Personal Finance and Retirement Planning for Morningstar. Our guest today is Eric Schoenstein. Eric is a Managing Director at Jensen Investment Management, where he serves as the firm's Chief Investment Officer and is a Portfolio Manager of several Jensen strategies, including its flagship Quality Growth Strategy. That strategy is a concentrated portfolio of 25 to 30 stocks of growing businesses that Jensen's team believes boast durable competitive advantages. Prior to joining Jensen in 2002, Eric was a senior manager at Arthur Anderson. He earned his bachelor's degree in business administration from Oregon State University. He's also a trustee and the board chair for the Oregon State University Foundation Board of Trustees. Eric, welcome to The Long View. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. We're happy to have you. Thanks so much for doing this. I wanted to start macro. Uh, Many are comparing the current growth-led market, I I guess until recently we could say growth-led market, to the tech and internet frenzy of the late 1990s. Is a very experienced growth investor, albeit one with a focus on quality. Do you see the same parallels? Um, You know, Jeff, I, I don't know that we would see necessarily the same parallels. I think there, you know, there could be some pieces that feel similar, certainly in terms of some of the data charts that you might look at and, you know, and things like that, that would, you know, sort of show some of the same vulnerabilities. Um, you know, I, I think what I would say, though, is that the previous period that, you know, that you referenced from the late 90s, I mean, you really were dealing with a different environment from the standpoint that many of the business models and, frankly, just the, the idea of what was disrupting things at that point in time, you know, from a company perspective, you know, the Internet was was the big thing and dot coms were the big thing. And, and frankly, most of those businesses didn't really last for fundamental reasons. They didn't produce cash flow. They didn't produce, you know, strong earnings and revenue growth, uh, which would allow them to reinvest and sustain for the long term. I think, you know, what we're seeing in terms of the current growth led market, there are some similarities, no question. I think actually at the end of last year, if you looked at the Russell 2000, for instance, the number of unprofitable companies was nearly 50%. You know, clearly that's not something we invest in. We're looking at, you know, strong, high quality, fundamental businesses with high degrees of free cash flow. And so that's not an area we're in, but it certainly is an area that has received a lot of investment. And so from that perspective, it may feel a little bit similar, but I think there's a number of other factors and other parts of the market that, frankly, are not seeing that kind of similarity. And the real challenge that we're seeing right now and the real sort of issue is how do you as an investor sort of pivot from what has been a high return environment, maybe not necessarily high growth in terms of business performance, but a high return environment to one that inevitably needs to be thought of as a much lower return environment. So how are you thinking about making that pivot? Well, for us, it's really not, I wouldn't call it so much of a pivot for us because our strategy and our investment philosophy has always been long-term in nature, investing through the cycle And, you know, when you approach investing from a longer term perspective, you're, you know, okay, last year or the last three years, I had great returns. Where do I go to get those great returns again? I mean, our clients certainly understand markets will go through downturns. Markets will inevitably go through corrections. Um, Our clients certainly also understand uh, that, you know, really long-term investing and successful long-term investing is more about time in the market rather than timing the market. And that distinction, while, you know, may not appear to be a large one, I think it's an important one. And that's really where, you know, from the standpoint of what we're facing now and, and what we're thinking about, you know, we're always trying to take information regarding our businesses and regarding sort of the overall business environment and determining what that means from the long-term opportunities for future growth and then ultimately future stock price appreciation. And that doesn't change. The impacts and factors will change, 
and the obviously our our discounted cash flow modeling that we do for our businesses that helps us determine whether a stock looks attractive will change, but the underlying philosophy remains very much the same. I wanted to shift and talk a little bit about risk management. I think I maybe I heard you or one of your colleagues, you know, describe your approach is is risk first. And so that seems like a logical place to go earlier in our conversation. The holdings in your flagship strategy, Jensen Quality Growth, were recently trading for around, and this is an estimate, 25 times forward earnings in aggregate. Can you talk about how you manage valuation risk and, and what gives you comfort that the portfolio you've built, you know, notwithstanding its quality, that it isn't too rich? Sure. I think it's a good question. Although I do think there's some things to think about within what you talked about. And this is maybe a distinction that we can look to uh, or talk about further. Um, you know, a, a price earnings multiple, you mentioned 25 times forward earnings. You know, generally speaking, that 25 times measure, uh, it, you know, usually that's a forward 12 month sort of notion. Um, you know, our investment horizon for our businesses is frankly considerably longer than that. When we model our businesses, we're looking at a 10-year growth phase and a drawdown phase where incremental return on equity begins to decline and ultimately a terminal phase. That's a very different proposition than trying to look at something that, in effect, would be somewhat of a snapshot in time. Now, from the standpoint of managing the risk of that, you know, it really, for us, risk is broadly, I would say, sort of three areas that we look to. One is to mitigate and manage sort of fundamental risk in the business. In other words, what's going on in a business and what risks are there to that um, that would create, you know, maybe perhaps even failure risk as a final nail in the coffin. We're also looking to mitigate pricing risk. In other words, these are high quality businesses. Our strategy has always been focused on companies that frankly will probably trade at premiums to the broader market because, you know, people are willing to pay for quality uh, whether that's in companies or consumer goods or anything else. And so we need to be cognizant of the pricing dynamic to make sure we don't overpay. And the last one would be what I'll call stock specific risk or security specific risk, where, you know, now we're looking at, okay, what are the relative position sizes that we want for individual companies? Not every company will be, you know, the, our number one position and not every company will be our number 29 position. And so from that perspective, that I think is where we will, fold in, you know, maybe some cross checks related to relative valuation to each other, where some of the multiple issues like you talked about could come into play. But I, I would say, frankly, that right now, and frankly, especially over the last couple of months, the valuation construct for our portfolio and the markets more generally has certainly come down. And yet, you know, relative to the benchmarks, we do not see a high premium over the benchmark PE for our strategy. And frankly, that correlates to our own DCF measures where we see, frankly, a lot of attractive opportunities, even within what we're considering a compressed growth environment. And I think it's the attractiveness of the opportunity, the strength of the fundamentals of these individual businesses and then our stock-specific or security-specific work that gives us comfort that the portfolio right now, one, isn't too rich, and two, will, from a long-term perspective, do a good job of mitigating risk on behalf of our investors. Lately, the quality growth strategy does seem to be capturing more of the downside than has been typical for it over time. What's the risk-reward profile that you seek to attain, and what about how you pick stocks and structure the portfolio confers that? Well, I think it's important to stress that we invest for the full cycle. And, you know, within a cycle, there will be periods that will, you know, certainly be negative and certainly be positive. What we've seen over the last couple of months is a number of factors all hitting virtually at the same time. You know, everything from more realistic recognition of interest rates that are rising or likely to rise. You've got inflation concerns that are certainly deep and everyone's well aware of and all of the logic and reasoning behind that. And then on top of that is, you know, clearly the humanitarian crisis with the invasion of Ukraine. And that's obviously added to the nature of all of this. 
What I would say, though, is, and I think this is where the cycle really comes into play, you know, if you go back to the last what we'll call full market cycle, frankly, from October of 2007 to roughly right before the bear market at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, that, at, in February of 2020, you know, that generally was about a 12 and a half year cycle. That's obviously a long cycle for many investors to think about, but I think it's um uh, illustrative of what we look for from our strategy. If we look at that entire period of time, major downturn, major upturns, and lots of growth in between, the strategy captured about a little bit over 90% of all of the up market capture, the up market opportunity, while at the same time, you know, participated at about an 80%, a little bit over 80% level in the down markets that took place in that same time frame. And so the overall picture was, is that if you were invested in our quality growth strategy over that course of time versus the S&P 500, there was an annualized outperformance of about 125 basis points for that period of time. Now, that wasn't linear. That wasn't something that happens each and every year. But it speaks to what we think the risk reward profile should be is that if you look at investing as a full cycle opportunity, then you should be looking for strategies that can outperform over that full cycle. And we think our strategy certainly has shown that over time. The thing I would say about the current market and the current environment is, you know, we're very early in what I would call a new cycle. Um, arguably, if you want to talk about it having started in 2020, you know, we've barely gotten into it. And you certainly have some some very interesting dynamics impacting how things should be looked at at this point in time. And I think it's too short of a period of time to try to draw too much in the way of major conclusions, particularly given the fact that we've got what I'll call some exogenous impacts from the war on Ukraine, the certainly the unprecedented stimulus that took place during the pandemic, you know, five trillion and growing. You know, those are some things that have yet to fully play out in terms of the full cycle. So, you know, we're disappointed to not see slightly better performance in this down period. But we've certainly always known that investing is a marathon and it's certainly not a sprint. And to evaluate it in a two month period feels like you're looking for it as a sprint. Yeah. Speaking of marathons, I would say, <laughs> you know, just when I look at your typical holding period versus the average mutual funds, it's it's pretty clear that you view it that way because you trade very infrequently. I think the turnover has typically been below 20% per year in your flagship strategy, which means you're holding stocks for five plus years on average. Can you talk about the margin of safety you demand before you enter a name and, and how you might modify or relax that margin of safety requirement while you hold a stock along the way? Yeah, I think, you know, I think one of the things that's important here is, um, you know, we don't have a specified margin of safety at which point we would enter a name. You know, our discounted cash flow analysis work that we do is predicated on, you know, trying to really build up an entire sort of valuation look at all of the businesses we invest in. We typically only invest in 25 to 30 companies. So the good news is, is that our team of six that manages this investment strategy, we have the capacity to be able to go through those 25 to 30 business models. We want to, you know, really make sure we're encompassing or capturing all of the various elements of the fundamental profile of the business. And frankly, the margin of safety will be different depending upon the company, depending upon the industry. You know, even the discount rate that we use will be different for every company. So we have a risk-free rate that's in place. We have an equity risk premium that we have uh, long determined using fundamental discount rate information from Duff and Phelps. And that information then comprises that discount rate and ultimately then helps us to get to what we believe the full value of the business to be. The margin of safety, frankly, will be, as I said, different for every company. It will also, frankly, be different depending upon the period that we're in. So to your point, you know, modifying or relaxing the margin of safety requirement you know, certainly in an environment of rising prices and perhaps even multiple expansion, as we've seen over the last three years, would have caused some compression in that margin of safety. Ultimately, though, it is a discipline, and the discipline does require us to have some margin of safety. And I think the idea of having something that's, you know, overly prescriptive or specific 
perhaps can actually, you know, sort of create some unintended consequences. Active investing, you know, it, frankly, is as much art as it is science. And I think the margin of safety issue is one where we believe we've got a disciplined process to help us manage that margin of safety risk and also be flexible within it to ensure that we're not overreacting to movements in market prices that could cause us to sell businesses at just the wrong time. Jeff mentioned your long holding period and you've held some of the fund's best performing stocks for more than a decade. You were probably tempted to sell along the way, at least for some of those names. Can you give an example of a decision where you let a name run beyond your estimate of its intrinsic value that paid off? And perhaps another example where you gave too much rope and it cost you performance? Well, I think one of the things that's important here is you know, the idea that intrinsic value sort of has a stopping point, you know, for us, that's just simply not the case. Intrinsic value or full value, we use those terms somewhat interchangeably, you know, really it rises over time. So another way to think about your question would be, you know, we've never really ever had uh, price targets for our businesses because those price targets will move as a business continues to create value. And ultimately, that value creation is what we think will be reflected in the stock price. But that ongoing value creation, that ongoing cash flow generation allows the measure of full value to continue to go up over time. And it's really more the relationship between what the stock price is trading at and that full or intrinsic value measurement that we're trying to manage. And so the idea that a company might run beyond our estimate of intrinsic value. I think the way we would look at that, and this is something we've done for a number of years, is we have a base case of what we think the valuation is worth. And we also have a best case for what we believe the valuation could be. And, you know, really it becomes a scenario where if it exceeds the best case, clearly we've got something that is in need of certainly trimming at the outset Reevaluation of the entire valuation model, the discounted cash flow model, and then potentially a complete sell if it's trading you know beyond that best case scenario. And part of our balance is to try to make sure that we're reassessing these businesses on an ongoing basis. And I think that's also an element that hopefully puts us in a position where we're not holding on to companies too long. We will take profits along the way, and certainly that's been something that we've hopefully been able to do. I'd say, you know, to give to your example specifically, I'd say, you know, one that we've allowed or a company we've allowed to sort of run a little bit. You know, again, this gets back to the art and the science. You know, we've had into it in our portfolio for a while, and it's a company that can run pretty well sometimes. It's certainly had a lot of growth, and we've allowed it to run, and that's paid off in those periods where we did allow it to run. Now, obviously, it's down this year, but you know I think that's a good example of one that paid off in our favor. Um, you know I don't know that we really have an example of one where it cost us from the standpoint of our interaction on companies because we do trim. There is a discipline. It's not simply let it run and not really go back and focus and think about it. We are keeping a close eye on these companies. You know, one of the hallmarks of our process is that our entire investment team meets every single morning. And the purpose of that meeting is to talk about anything going on inside our businesses, both fundamentally and from a valuation perspective. So the likelihood that something that would really go beyond what we believe it's worth and we would continue to give it too much rope is something I would say is really not very likely to occur. It's more likely to take place more on the fundamental side where we've maybe perhaps missed something on the fundamental structure. And we should have gotten out of a company a little bit further. That's one of the hallmark challenges for, you know, high conviction active managers is to make sure you don't fall in love with your companies. And we, uh, we've we probably had a couple of examples like that in the past, but we work hard to make those very few and far between. I wanted to shift and talk about quality, which is another, I would say, telltale aspect of your investment process. I'd be remiss if I didn't ask about, you know, one of the things that's changed about quality investing, which is the availability of, you know, low cost mechanized options for getting quality, quote unquote, their quality screen ETFs that charge a fraction of 
of what you do at Jensen Quality Growth and Mechanized Stock Selection, as I mentioned before. What do you think those who might be tempted to choose one of these ETFs might want to bear in mind before they take the plunge? Speaking as you know, somebody that's spent years and years actively investing in stocks through a quality lens? Yeah, this is a question that we've certainly heard over time, and I think it's increased in time more recently. I, I think the challenge with factor-based, uh, or I guess mechanized, to use your term, uh, strategies where they're trying to load, for instance, on a quality factor. You know, the challenge is, and what we've seen of, over our research of some of those strategies is, one, the quality factors, frankly, have seemingly changed over time. In other words, they haven't remained consistent partially because I think those strategies are being managed and as return profiles don't measure up, they look for different ways to manage the quality factor and how it's loaded. I think another distinction would be that, you know, if you're investing in in those kinds of strategies, inevitably they begin to look a bit more like indexes, far more holding certainly than what we have. I mean, we generally will only hold 25 to 30 companies in our, you know, high value creation, actively managed high conviction strategy. And I don't think that would be the case with some of those factor-based strategies. And, you know, the issue becomes then in an effort to load those strategies where they capture similar performance in terms of downside participation, you end up exposing a strategy perhaps to a lower amount of participation when markets go up. And that's almost exactly the opposite of what you want to be doing. So it's very different. They have not necessarily proven themselves. And I think the other issue here, and this is perhaps maybe the more important one I should have led with, is, you know, the factor basis for those kinds of investment products is backwards looking. Um, You know, I'll be the first one to tell you our return on equity requirement of 15 percent a year for 10 consecutive years is backward looking. But our research doesn't stop there. If you were to go back to 2008, the financial crisis, you probably would have had a, a quality factor that would have ranked banks and home builders quite highly. And yet in 2008, the banks and the home builders that would have been present in our universe at the time, those all fell out. And it became something that was a real distinction between legacy moats and true durable competitive advantages. And I think that's one of the distinctions that quality factor-based ETFs had a harder time trying to capture in looking forward. High-quality firms possess traits that most investors covet, so can you explain the mechanics of earning excess returns in names that generally tend to trade at higher multiples than the broad market? Does it come down to expecting the firm to outgrow the expectations you believe the market is priced in? I don't know that I would say it's about outgrowing the expectations of the market, although certainly that could be a component of it. You know, our thesis and valuation has always been around discounted cash flow, as I said. You know, these are mature companies because they've had that minimum 10-year track record. You know, they're generally mature companies. And in many cases, they've had track records longer than that. From our perspective, the effort here is to participate in the value creation of the business models. You know, our research has shown to us over three decades that competitive advantages matter. And competitive advantages are correlated with the ability to create value. And ultimately, consistent value creation can be correlated to stock price appreciation from a long-term perspective. You know, for us, it's really not about trying to capture expanding multiples. Um, Multiple expansion for us has generally been more of a bonus to our returns rather than a foundation of our returns. The foundations of the return profile have largely been based upon the value creation in the business. And then you've got, in a lot of cases, a dividend payment that acts as a supplement to that value creation and frankly can also act as a compensation to shareholders during those periods where they may need to be patient with the investment. And then multiple expansion, as I mentioned, becomes sort of the bonus. So you know, in a high multiple environment, in a low multiple environment, ultimately, we're still trying to look at, do we have 
reason and justification for strong growth expectations in the future or sound, really said better, sound value creation opportunities in the future? And are those opportunities priced appropriately at today's market price? And if we can find those kinds of businesses and, you know, for 30 years, we think we've done that, then that will generally overcome sort of the vagaries of what multiples might do and also allow us to focus on what our expectations for the business is rather than trying to overly concern ourselves about what might or might not be priced in from a market expectation. So I was actually going to ask about multiple expansion and what role that assumption might play in your process, but you kind of answered it. But I guess my next question is, when you've done sort of performance attribution analysis, looking at the strategy's performance, I mean, has that borne itself out where the bulk of your performance has come from dividends and fundamental improvement rather than multiple expansion over time? Yes. Generally speaking, that's been the case, Jeff. It's shown itself. And it's not, again, these are not things that will be an absolutes. Um, look, I, I will be the first person to say I, I have no problem enjoying and accepting multiple expansion as an opportunity to create value. But to to use that as the primary in terms of how we would view our strategy, or if that were to be the primary logic behind what our return profile is, you know, I think all of us would have a very, very difficult time with that as a statement. And And the research would definitely show from our perspective and from our research that Multiple expansion, again, it acts as a kicker. We will absolutely take it when it comes, but it, you know, it's also something we need to recognize isn't going to be there over time. And what will be there in our minds over time are durable competitive advantages, consistent cash flow generation that's used to reinvest into those competitive advantages, supplement them, or perhaps even add to them. And then ultimately, through those competitive advantages, you get execution in a business model that allows for real value creation that isn't reliant, frankly, on multiple expansion. And our our research would show that that's very much been the case. We've spoken to other guests about the durability of competitive advantages. It seems like economic moats aren't lasting as long as before, given the speed of innovation and other factors. So have you seen that in the research that you do? For example, has your eligible stocks list shrunk? Actually, if anything, our ultimate list of companies that we can invest in has grown. Um, I've been here nearly 20 years and, uh, you know, certainly some of it is better data, better tool sets that we have at our disposal to dig into the fundamental data information that we have. But anecdotally, I can tell you that in September of 2002, when Val Jensen, our founder, sat down with me on our first day, my first day, and handed me the Jensen universe. At that point in time, it was 119 names. Today, it's over 320. So. I think it's pretty clear the universe has grown over time. Uh, to your question or to your point around competitive advantages, competitive advantages, yes, I think it's possible that, you know, certainly disruption is clearly something that happens. New entrants come in. That's the whole point of, you know, business competition is you start with something that you identify the market doesn't have but needs and that you can provide, and you ultimately hope you get paid for you know what you create. And eventually, somebody may try to do it better than you, and that can change the competitive advantages. I, I would say though that you know the durability of those, you know, I think that still remains a very strong statement. And the strongest firms, the ones that really understand the long term nature of what they're trying to do constantly are reinvesting to shore up those advantages. And and while there will be disruption, you know, I, I think those competitive advantages can remain somewhat elongated more than people might be willing to appreciate. And then the other component of this is that, as I said, that reinvestment, you know, these are hallmark businesses that have consistently seen the threats on the horizon and have constantly tried to invest in new opportunities to stave off that competition. Um, You know, I think the importance here is making sure that 
we are critically assessing that durability. And in some cases, the very disruption that could take place becomes a new opportunity for expansion. I think about technology firms today. And frankly, you know, I look at something you know, where cloud has become a huge driver of growth for companies like Microsoft and Google and Amazon and others. And in some respects, you know, cloud and the investments in cloud have actually become an extension of competitive advantage rather than some sort of disruptive threat because you end up driving scale, economic scale and economic scope by selling incremental customers into your cloud-based environment. And I think that's something that almost extends the competitive advantage rather than shortening it. I'd say another example might be MasterCard. You know, MasterCard, most people think, oh, it's, you know, your credit card. But the reality is MasterCard sees and recognizes that there are constant regulatory threats and constant new entrants trying to infringe upon their business. And they are themselves reinvesting the large cash flows that they produce into new ways to participate in all kinds of non-cash based transactions in a way to expand their footprint and profile and advantages rather than having them shrink. Yeah, maybe building on that last answer, I'm curious, do you think that there's a possibility that the market with rates rising will become less forgiving to management teams that to this point have boldly experimented trying to stand up businesses and maybe areas that weren't adjacent to what the firm had focused on to this point? Um, or do you think that's not the case because many of these management teams have proven that they can make these sorts of hard pivots successfully? And then my sort of related question is, I guess, how has your evaluation of management teams as capital allocators, how has that evolved over time as you've had some of these businesses that come along that are so dominant and throw off so much cash flow that they have the ability to go to range into these areas and experiment in ways that would have been unthinkable previously? Let me get to the second part of your question on the management teams. I mean, I think, you know, management assessment or, you know, understanding what is making those management teams successful is a key component to understanding and really, in our minds, knowing what you own. I mean, I think that's one of the key considerations as we think about a rising interest rate environment or the potential for, you know, lower cash flow generation from a lot of businesses is really knowing what you own and what the prospects are is an important element. And management is certainly part of that. You know, we've long visited with the management teams of our businesses. We've obviously had to kind of change how we do that with the pandemic and, and the lack of travel for business purposes and doing a lot more through, you know, virtual and other settings. But, you know, frankly, not much has changed from that perspective. I think good management is ultimately good management. and it becomes something that's more about really understanding and looking at, you know, how are they being incentivized? How is their board in this case uh, for public companies? You know, how is the board holding their feet to the fire? And if they're doing a good job of that, then the likelihood is that the investors don't also have to do that because they can, you know, sort of look to the management team to do what's in their best interest. Um, you know, 20 years ago, as we were looking at the internet crisis, I mean, once upon a time, we were looking at management teams and probably generally, I think investors were saying, wow, if they're not investing in the internet, you know, the internet's going to take over the world. And if they're not doing that, then clearly they're mismanaging and they're not, you know, utilizing their cash flow appropriately. And, you know, then all of those companies or a lot of those businesses went belly up and we've sort of reinvented ourselves. And ultimately, you know, I, I certainly think that it's feasible that investors might show lower patience, but I think the lower patience is because the return patterns and profiles are coming down. I think what we would suggest is really looking at how those businesses are reinvesting. What are they doing with their free cash flow and what kinds of opportunities are they investing in? And if they're doing those things appropriately, it's okay to have a lower return profile. It's okay to actually take a little bit of a pause given the strong returns we've had for the last three years. You know, arguably, if you were invested in the index, the S&P 500, for instance, you essentially doubled your money in three years. That's an unheard of pace. So to have some patience before you expect that to happen again is certainly, I think, you know, something that might be worth considering. And from an investment in the businesses themselves, Again, this gets back to, you know, 
what are they doing with the free cash flow? And importantly, do they have the free cash flow to continue to reinvest? And that to me is a, maybe a different distinction, kind of back to what I said earlier about, you know, half the Russell 2000 not even being profitable. Those businesses simply don't have that cash flow. And I think in environments where we are right now, current cash and current cash flow is a strong mitigator to perhaps some of those short-term concerns. And ultimately, that cash and cash flow that's being generated will pay off once we get back to you know being beyond some of these more difficult challenges. What's one stock you wish you could own in quality growth, but that hasn't cleared your return on equity hurdle? <laughs> actually, I hate to say this this way, but the way I would actually answer that is we've got a wonderful opportunity set of 300 and plus names. And, you know, I think there are always going to be, you know, opportunities within that set where we wish we could continue to own a business or maybe own a business because it gets too expensive or something like that. But I don't know that we've ever really looked at it and said, like, for instance, something that doesn't qualify for our universe. Is there something that we would say, oh, I wish we could own that? I think, you know, this is maybe one of the benefits of three decades of learning is for every company that would have been like, oh, that would have been the lights out investment that we couldn't take advantage of because of our universe requirements or something like that. You know, for as many opportunities that might be there that are like that, there are a lot more opportunities where you, yes, maybe you miss the upside, but then when that doesn't pan out, you miss all of the downside. And this, again, would sort of go back to like the internet age or the internet bust or the financial crisis is these companies, there can be businesses that can reverse in very, very quick fashion. And I think the beauty of a long-term investment strategy is that you're really looking at it as a long-term proposition. And, you know, in our case, we feel very good about the fact that we've got a very robust universe within which to work. You know, I said 320 plus names. We're only invested in just under 10% of that entire universe. So I, I think we've got plenty of opportunities to consistently look at new businesses for inclusion and yet not really have had too many that we've, you know, said, oh, gosh, I wish we could have been invested in X. I think we're constantly looking, frankly, more forward than we are looking backwards and sort of wistful at something we might not have had the opportunity to take advantage of. I wanted to shift and talk stocks. We've talked sort of about some of the important undergirding concepts when it comes to stock selection and portfolio construction, but I thought we could talk about some of your holdings specifically. You've owned Microsoft, which I think you've alluded to at least once during the course of this conversation. Mm -hmm. In the quality growth strategy, I think it's the second largest holding. Uh, you've held it for a long time. Around the time you bought it, I think the firm was more reliant on things like you know, the Windows operating system, hardware sales cycle. I think the Bing search engine was you know, thought to be a potential value driver for the firm at that time. Times have obviously changed. So can you talk about your original thesis for owning Microsoft, compare that to now, and, and maybe what lessons do those differences impart? Yeah, I think Microsoft's an interesting, obviously an interesting case study. Um, I think we first purchased it, I believe it was in 2005. And you're right, at the time it was all about the Windows operating system, frankly, all about the PC, as the former CEO used to say. You know, it was all things PC. And, you know, and at the time our thesis was, look, this is a really good business. There's a lot to like, but perhaps they were, you know, a little bit indiscriminate in how they spent the vast cash flow that they were generating. And we wanted to see some more discipline. And we did begin to see what we thought was a bit more of a disciplined approach to cash flow deployment. Now, obviously, in hindsight, I think a lot of people in the late 2000s, even into the early 2010s, you know, the reality was Microsoft was considered to be uh, dead money, if you will. Um, but I think the underlying parts of the thesis that we had at the time, some of those pieces are still very much in place. The Windows operating system, the idea that the company was providing something that was ubiquitous within the enterprise and that would have huge market share that we believed would not erode over time from the standpoint of Windows and, and the operating system itself. And the office suite of products also, you know, Word and Excel, et cetera, 
that's very much remained the same. I mean, their market share in those areas hasn't really changed. I think what's changed and the pivot point here. Yeah, you know, I think one of the things historically Microsoft struggled with is they weren't necessarily a company that exhibited some of the first mover advantages that you might expect a company like that to have. But I think with the new CEO, when Nadella took over, there was a shift. And what we saw and what I think one of the things that was really sort of a, maybe not an aha moment, but a real pivot point for the business was when it started talking about three screens in a cloud. In other words, we're not going to just be for what you do in your office. We're going to be for all of your devices. We're going to be interconnected. And we're not going to be just about the PC. We're going to be more across different platforms. And I think if there was a lesson learned from that, look, I still think there was value creation in the business during that period where the market looked at it as dead money. And I think our patience has been rewarded. We've seen a lot more change in the last 10 years, certainly, than what we saw in maybe the last seven or eight years than what we saw in the first seven or eight years of our investment. But I think this is one where, you know, the value creation was continuing. The market arguably was penalizing the business more. I think it's certainly been referred to, and if you go back in history, of the, you know, the bomber overhang or the you know, effect and things like that, which that wasn't about what was happening in the business. They just needed something to help unlock the value. And once that was unlocked, we've seen tremendous growth. And I think even now, as much growth as the company has had, I think one of the things that stock prices can sometimes do is underappreciate cash generation. And in Microsoft's case, I think that's been certainly one of the cases that's happened. And now we've really got a business that's very much still the same kind of business. It's serving small and mid-sized customers you know, servers and software. It's just that the whole approach to how companies access the servers and software has changed and become something that's actually become even a stronger competitive advantage than what it was when we first owned the business. Our lesson is, you know, this is one where I would say patience was a virtue. And the patience really was only achieved because we could see the value being created year in and year out and the cash flow being generated year in and year out. If that hadn't been taken place, we may not have stuck with the investment and that ultimately would have been to the detriment of our investors. I'm sure you never tire of answering questions about Amazon, which the quality growth strategy has never owned. Can you talk about (laughs) which of your names is most vulnerable to an incursion by Amazon and also how you've been able to satisfy yourself that you'll still get paid for courting that risk? It seems like healthcare and pharma might be one such area. Yeah, Amazon, um, you know, it's obviously it's a business model that is disruptive. There's no question about that. Um, the reality of the business, however, is that it does not, let's go back to the beginning, 15% return on equity each and every year for 10 consecutive years. Amazon doesn't have that track record yet. Let me state that, right? Yet. It is generating it and it is building it, but it isn't there yet. And frankly, before it started on that path, you know, Amazon, let's not forget, within the last decade had years where they lost money. You know, it was more about revenue growth rather than profits and cash flow growth. And that's totally fine. It's the business that wants to run itself that way. And we don't have any issue with that. It just doesn't meet our standards. You know, I'd say we certainly have seen the opportunity for disruption from Amazon in all kinds of different places. However, I think in each and every case where we've seen, you know, like they're, they're absolutely competitors with Microsoft and Google, both in our strategy from the cloud perspective and providing infrastructure, cloud infrastructure, you know, companies on the consumer space like Nike and TJX have certainly had to deal with the potential for disruption. Although I would say in, you know, both of their cases, I think they've done a really nice job of reaching into their consumers on a more direct basis to help offset the impact of a wide distribution network like Amazon. Um, you know, quite frankly, I'm not sure that we've seen on the healthcare side and the pharma side as much disruption as we have on more of the, you know, what I would say more distribution. I think there's still more to play at that. I'd say probably the easiest thing to think about from a disruption perspective or an Amazon effect, if you will, would be in delivery, which would be UPS. And UPS is a holding of ours, where there's no question that we've owned that for a little bit. 
you know, how we manage that, how we think about that is more, this is, again, I mentioned earlier, stock specific or security specific risk when constructing our portfolio. Not every company is going to deserve a place at the top of the portfolio. And I think UPS, as a result of some of the challenges that they face as Amazon competes with them, is one of those businesses that generally ought to be more towards the bottom third of our portfolio. Has great competitive advantages, lots of free cash flow, but also has very dynamic competition that we need to keep an eye on. And as a result of that assessment, it's in the bottom third of our portfolio intentionally. I think for many other businesses, one of the potential benefits of the pandemic, and I would never want to actually say there were you know real benefits, but one of the outcomes I get maybe said better is, you know, a lot of businesses were forced to confront very different distribution, sort of more broad-based distribution. If you think about how we all decided to order online and pick up at the store, you know, parking lot delivery from Home Depot and Target and all these other companies. And that has sort of recreated a consumer experience for those companies that Amazon actually has a harder time meeting, at least for the time being. Yes, they do some same-day delivery, but the idea of Prime was to disrupt all of that. And yet many businesses have fought back. So I think this is actually one of those things where there's some give and take in this. And it's certainly one that bears sort of constant monitoring because they're always looking for new areas to disrupt and new ways to think about things. But I think the really resilient businesses that do actually have stronger competitive advantages that are durable and that they continue to reinvest in, they'll have success in fighting off some of that competition. And I think by and large, we've seen that for now, these companies are holding that Amazon disruption you know, mostly at bay. I wanted to talk about another category of risk, which is ESG risk. I know that ESG is a dimension of your process. I wanted to talk about it in the context of Stryker, the medical devices firm. It's another name you've owned for a long time, and it boasts a number of attractive attributes as a business. But I know it's also been flagged before for some of the issues with product safety, especially as it relates to hip implants. Is it fair to say that your goal in a case like Stryker isn't to minimize ESG risks like these, but rather to ensure you're being paid adequately for them? Well, I think it's worth you know recognizing ESG uh, we see a lot of correlation between ESG and, and quality. You know, good business practices and good ESG practices, for lack of a better way to put that, there's a lot of similarity there or a lot of correlation there. If you're being good stewards in the environment and being good stewards of your stakeholders more broadly, you know, you do a lot of good things for the E and the S. And at the same time, Also, frankly, do a lot of the good things for the business itself, Um, lowering costs, increasing efficiency, treating your employees, treating your communities appropriately. You know, we think there's certainly strong alignment with that. Um, We're not an ESG product. The quality growth strategy is not an ESG product, but I think it certainly is one where we see, call it a dual mandate that exists between those two, where we can produce what we believe to be very strong financial returns and investment returns, and at the same time have good value alignment with our clients. Now, in the case of the one you mentioned, the company you mentioned, Stryker, I think it's worth noting it's a risky endeavor. They're trying, you know, if you think about their orthopedic business, you're trying to solve issues related to essentially replacing human anatomy. That is not an endeavor that should be thought of as a zero defect, you know, some game. Um, They do have certainly robust regulatory review, and occasionally you will have recalls, product issues, things like that. Um, I think that, you know, here's one thing we would certainly look at is there's certainly a part of doing business, especially in the healthcare space, is that there are risks. Yes, we want to be compensated for them, but I think it's also worth keeping in mind what is it that they've been dealing with and how has that turned out in the face of the business more broadly? I think in the last three years or so, we've seen a little over $300 million that the company has paid out for recalls. Now, that sounds like a very substantial sum, and I'm not trying to diminish the impact to individual patients, but 
that 300 million has been paid out in a time frame where they've generated almost nine billion dollars in cash flow from operations. So it's a very, very small part of what's happened within the business. And that cash flow has been reinvested to, you know, shore up those areas where recalls are taking place to try to constantly innovate where there are, you know, issues with any of their devices to the next generation of devices that hopefully won't have those issues. I don't want to be so, you know, in summary fashion to say, look, it's just the cost of doing business. We do want to see them trying to do the right thing. I would argue, and we would certainly look at it as, are they trying to do the right thing and then occasionally have something that is a bit of a misstep where they have to correct before they can continue to move forward? Or is it something where they're actually doing something that's frankly a lot more damaging and frankly not taking responsibility? That would be a much more difficult ESG challenge for us and frankly just a business challenge that we would probably not want to invest in. For our last question, I'd like to ask, what's a hot topic of debate on your investment team right now? Perhaps you can give us one that's sort of macro and another that is more sort of stock or industry specific. I'd say right now the hot topics are probably exactly what you'd expect. Um, I don't know that we're necessarily debating inflation or how many times the Fed's going to raise interest rates. Um, you know, that's certainly been a hot topic more broadly. I'd say, you know, if there is something we are paying attention to right now that's that's a bit of a topic, what impacts, you know, if what's happening with between Russia and Ukraine, and first and foremost, we absolutely – Understand this is a humanitarian crisis, first and foremost, and that's the most important focus here. But, you know, as we think about it from a longer term perspective, and we hear and see all of what companies are doing, what governments are doing to try to force Russia's hand and get them to, you know, pull out and, and stop this unfortunate invasion. You know, I think that one, one of the things we're talking about is what changes is this going to create to the global economy? Um, you know, you're talking about major reconfiguration of supply chains, potential major reconfiguration of raw material sourcing and raw material element delivery. Um, and so what impacts are those things going to have if this continues or if we are entering a new phase of sort of a protracted new Cold War between you know, the West and the East in such a way where it makes it much more difficult to do business as we've thought about it over the last 20, 30 years. Um, we don't have any answers to that. I'm not suggesting that we do or that anybody else would at this point, because those are hard to predict. But that certainly is something that's causing us to think differently about or try to start thinking differently about how we evaluate our companies. And I think that macro impact will potentially have broad reaching impacts across, frankly, almost every company in our portfolio. So it won't necessarily be a single stock or a single industry that could be impacted by that topic. You know, from a more acute macro perspective, I think one of the nice things about the way we invest, one of the positives about how we invest in utilizing pillars like competitive advantage and free cash flow is that these are businesses that are built for environments of higher volatility and environments where there are other cost pressures on their business model. The cash flow they generate and the cash flow reserves they have allow them to continue to invest through the challenging parts of the cycle so that they can continue to thrive when the cycle turns more positive. And so from that perspective, we're anxious to see this period go behind us and move you know, to a more positive construct fundamentally. We also have confidence that the business models are built to survive through this type of environment much better than those that don't have the competitive advantages and the cash flows that we've long sought as part of the Jensen Quality Growth Strategy. Well, Eric, this has been a very interesting discussion. Thanks so much for sharing your insights with us. We've really enjoyed talking to you. Yeah, it's been my pleasure. And thank you so much for your time today as well. I've enjoyed talking to both of you, Jeff and Christine. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us on The Long View. If you could, please take a minute to subscribe to and rate the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.
You can follow us on Twitter at S-Youth1, which is S-Y-O-U-T-H and the number one. And at Christine underscore Benz. George Cassidy is our engineer for the podcast, and Carrie Gretchik produces the show notes each week. Finally, we'd love to get your feedback. If you have a comment or a guest idea, please email us at thelongview at morningstar.com. Until next time, thanks for joining us. This recording is for informational purposes only and should not be considered investment advice. Opinions expressed are as of the date of recording. Such opinions are subject to change. The views and opinions of guests on this program are not necessarily those of Morningstar Inc. and its affiliates. Morningstar and its affiliates are not affiliated with this guest or his or her business affiliates unless otherwise stated. Morningstar does not guarantee the accuracy or the completeness of the data presented herein. Jeff Patak is an employee of Morningstar Research Services, LLC. Morningstar Research Services is a subsidiary of Morningstar Inc. and is registered with and governed by the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. Morningstar Research Services shall not be responsible for any trading decisions, damages, or other losses resulting from or related to the information, data analyses, or opinions, or their use. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. All investments are subject to investment risk, including possible loss of principal. Individuals should seriously consider if an investment is suitable for them by referencing their own financial position, investment objectives, and risk profile before making any investment decisions.